Well, it's Easter time again, and in addition to all the Easter music, I'm hoping that gets more use and uh, downloads on stock libraries, the uh, Cadbury eggs and other candy that I will eat way too much of, uh, and oh yeah, the Risen Savior that some of us may celebrate on Easter, that little thing. I thought it would be good to use a tired old metaphor like don't put all your eggs in one basket to talk <laughs> about the music income and maybe even respond to a video this week from our old friend Jesse over at Sync My Music. In his newest video, Jesse talks about how important it is to focus on the thing that you're trying to do and for him, obviously, that is sync licensing. Now, you should watch this video. I'm going to put it in the notes below. Make sure you watch it because, as usual, Jesse is right for the most part, as he usually is. Um, just because he's talking from his point of view, it's absolutely uh, probably the correct um, thing to think about. But definitely, he has success that has been built over dozens of of years in sync and that kind of income. And let's not forget about his channel, which is also uh, very popular. And, um, you know, all of his uh, sync teaching income and things like that. So, but for those of us, and mostly it means all of us who are probably not uh, able to afford to put all of the eggs in the sync licensing business and just focus it on it. Um, and just hopping that it works. Um, th <laughs> but this video is really for everybody. Um, okay, enough puns. Uh, uh, welcome to episode 62 of the Make Music Income podcast. As we do a lot on this podcast, we're going to talk about many ways to make music income and why most of us can't afford to just put all of our eggs in one basket in one thing, whether it's sync licensing for film or TV, whether it is stock music licensing, which uh, there's a lot of uh, mixed feelings about that. Probably you could say ill feelings about that right now if you look at our Discord. And um, even full-time income like producing, teaching, and other things I think Steve and I both agree that with Jesse about you really need to focus on your craft or making the main thing the main thing, as I seem to hear a lot these days. Um, but what about these things that Jesse is talking about, like selling beats and NFTs and gigs and merchandise and Spotify and session work and social media and remix competitions? Hmm. We'll touch on all of these today and more and why you may want a collection of lovely little Easter candies as well as that one luscious Cadbury egg that the Easter Bunny brings you. And speaking of cute little bunnies and a man who certainly delivers a lot of ear candy, he's my <laughs> podcast partner, Mr. Stevie B. Wow, that was quite the intro, man. Um <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I worked on it all for this morning five, for five minutes. Wow. Um, have I told you? I, I remember, I think we had this conversation last year around this time. Have I told you how obsessed I am with Cadbury eggs? Oh, no. I don't know. I am too. Uh, love I them. love them so much. I had I two actually, yesterday. I, there's two, things, two points I want to make about Cadbury eggs really quickly. <laughs> When I was a when I was a young boy, Cadbury <laughs> eggs were significantly bigger for one thing. They oh, yeah, downgraded yeah, yeah. They, in size. That's, I remember now. Which is which I'm I just think is the worst thing ever. They used to be wrapped in tin foil, which I really like too. Um, and I actually like them. what are they wrapped in now? Now they have well, I don't know what they're like in the states, but they're 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 in these annoying like plastic packages now. I'm just like oh no 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 we're we have those as well, and they're very small. They're like this small, but then we have the regular eggs that are wrapped in foil. Still, you do. Oh yeah, you got to send two of them. Are they the break, are they the original size? Absolutely. Oh, you well, got to send some over here. They are, as far as I remember, um, they the ones that come ones. in the plastic are small, like yeah. this big. But the other ones that I get are still the same. We don't size. have the foil ones here anymore. What? Yeah, it's so brutal. Man. Anyway, I love Canada. them so much. I actually told my wife to go buy a bunch of them and then place them in strategic areas of our apartment so that I stumble into them like you know at random times and I'm happily surprised it makes my day um I love the Cadbury eggs so <laughs> anyway. what else is going on this week up there besides um, your I'm sorry about your Cadbury egg problem I will have to send you some I don't know oh if my that's gosh, even please. possible does Canada allow Cadbury egg uh, <laughs> I imports know. I don't know <laughs> um 
what's going on? Uh, not a whole lot of exciting stuff going on on this week. Just kind of cleaning up, doing a lot of organizing, uh, finishing up projects for originals, finishing up course material. Um, yeah, I'm uh, working on a labs only track. That's uh, this month's challenge to create a track using nothing but labs. So that'll be fun uh, to showcase that early. Oh, April. That's right. I heard about that. Mm hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, other things are happening. You know, kind of getting like the summer stuff planned out. I'm uh, I've signed um, a couple contracts. One for uh, for a festival date in uh, June. Another for uh, a wedding. So some gigs are, are popping up uh, here and there, and I'm excited about that. And um, yeah, I'm kind of working on some travel plans. I'm going to be flying home um, in uh, August. Uh, for a bit to celebrate my parents 50th wedding anniversary which would be cool, cool. and um yeah you know uh other than that yeah put out my content id video yep. last uh yeah or this wednesday or last wednesday um and uh that was uh interesting you know i i waited forever for those for that damn november and december statement to come out they just really took their time with that well, one they and really they did. both and came, they out, came right? out back to back yeah. yeah they came out back to back uh, I was hoping they, they would be a little bit more because there'd been this exponential growth and it went down a little um, yeah. for the last couple of months. But uh, that's OK. Uh, still got, you know, around a thousand dollars to collect uh, for the awesome. for the fourth quarter, which is which is great. Way more than I, you know, an, an originally anticipated it would be um, random, random aside. But I, I uh, noticed that uh, between like I was watching Jesse's video uh, right before we uh, we logged on here and. Um, I noticed that there's a lot of comments going around about Dolby Atmos. Mm -hmm. have, have you seen this? Oh yeah, we we have it at the school, and we oh, mix you do? in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually don't know that much about it, but like I'm I'm kind of like tempted to get one of those uh, uh, like surround sound systems for uh, for the apartment here, so that I can kind of like start start to immerse myself in it. Um, but yeah, I noticed a few comments in uh, Jesse's video as well as uh, my last video about you know whether or not. Uh, we're all going to have to um, I'll add adopt that to the list here. Adopt this uh, this surround sound stuff for uh, for production music and and whatnot. We'll talk about that in the list. I just added it to the list here, so we'll talk about it in a minute. Cool. Anything else? No, I think that's about it. What's okay. going on with you? Well, um, a lot is going on. Except this week, I am. Uh, Oh, by the way, folks, that was Steve's week. And now, <laughs> <laughs> and now Eric's week. <laughs> He's talking about the banners for those. I was not. For those uh, listening. Yeah, if you're if you're not list if you're just listening, we I, we have banners that I do sometimes remember to click on, and sometimes I remember not to click on. But Eric, Eric's also week, wearing a great view view meter shirt, by the way. For yeah, those listening, uh, it was very great popular. Shirt. But um, yeah, I uh, you can get this on Amazon. I'm not like selling it or anything, but it, <laughs> I just found it on Amazon. Um, I am vacating this week. Um, I only have two days of students this week, and then I was off for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from teaching students. So I took the days as personal days, and so I have been chilling and working on just not much, actually. Like yesterday, I didn't do any, any work, I don't think. All I did was go to Disney nice. and walk around a couple parks and then Today, I'm just kind of hanging out here and going to sit in the sun a little bit. And then tomorrow, I'm going to Universal, and then we're going to a water park. So it's 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 sun and sip and chill a um, few days for me here. We Since we live in Orlando, there's a lot of vacation <laughs> places to go to. So it's kind of like staycations are real vacations here. Mm -hmm. But um, so mainly, I'm doing that. Um, I wrote a couple of new pieces a couple new pieces lately. One is a remix of the Maroon 5 song, Cold. I don't know if you ever remember that song, but we do a remix assignment in my class every at the end of every nine weeks, and they get the chance to do three or four different kinds of songs, and one of them that we have is Cold, and it's relatively easy because it's 100 beats per minute, and um, and so they remix to the to the stem of just the vocal. So I you will usually mess around with it too, just to see what I can do every every time and, and kind of we all just listen to all our remixes. But so I did a kind of a jazzy uh, funky remix of that, which is kind of fun. Cool. Uh, and then I did I also wrote a new little jazz lo fi thing that I might send you at some point to help me lo fi it because you know, I love to create things, but I don't love to create 
crappy sounding sounds. And unfortunately, lo-fi likes to use crappy sounding sounds. But this sounds like something that I might hear on, you know, a lo-fi playlist. And I listen to a lot of those at the at school. But uh, it's it's pretty cool. I like it. And um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, I also did a video this week that was a little similar to yours. I was really more talking about the different places I find my music being used, and Content ID was one of them. Mm -hmm. My Content ID actually went up um, in did this, it? in December. Yeah, it. Every month I'm I'm on a. I think you are too, but I'm on a continued like movement up of how many videos that are being monetized yeah 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 that's the one thing that is always increasing it's but it's always going yeah. up and uh but it doesn't always translate to more money every month that's and right yeah so uh for me though it did not not as much as you but maybe 50 60 bucks or something like that and i think overall i'm gonna have a a, a payout in whenever our next payout is next month i think and so I got to pay out. That's always a good thing. And again, it's just more back end money from the stock stuff that we make. And we'll talk more about that. But um, oh, I also pitched a, a, an album to a sync library yesterday, an album I've had done for a while. And you know, sometimes we can just sit on these things and not pitch them or make a song and that put it out. And so uh, I felt good about getting that out. Um, let's see. Uh, what else? Anything else? Um, I am uh, still working on my sync content. A lot of sync content is coming out by me just because I'm. I just released that getting in sync ebook, and mm -hmm. so you know what? That'll probably be a good place to start with this today. And you know, I think sometimes it's easy on this channel and on a lot of the uh, the gurus out there. There's a lot of people talking about sync licensing. I have an interview with John Meyer coming up. I don't know if you know who John is, but I follow sure. his channel. Yeah. And uh, we talk a lot about sync licensing. And one of the things he talks about is back when he got started, there was nobody talking about this on YouTube. And now it seems like there are many people talking about it. If For not sure. Jesse and Clint, you and me and other people are talking about it. And um, it's, a, it's a very... Uh, uh, cool thing to talk about these days and and people especially after once uh, COVID hit everybody is looking for some kind of passive income or something they can do from home and so sync and stock really uh, still stoke everybody's attention if they could do it they they'd love to have it I think um, it's still pretty niche though you know yeah mm -hmm. like yeah, it's still it, pretty like we think it's there's a lot of people talking about it but I feel like it, there could be even more and it's still like a fairly small little area of YouTube. I mean, even music production itself is like not a big, a gigantic topic when you compare it to other ones. Anyway, just a, yeah. just a thought. No doubt. And our, our friend Jesse, who runs Sync My Music and is probably, you have to think, one of the preeminent authorities on sync licensing as far as how to do it and how to start doing it and have success in it. Um, just did a video yesterday that he released, and it was called, um, let's see what it was called. I'm going to add this to the stream so we can see it. But it was called When Multiple Music Incomes Become a Problem. And I, I get that. Um, it, and he's talking here about a lot of different um, things. Some of the things we talk about, some of the things we don't talk about. And we'll get to all of these. But his mm -hmm. his focus for this video was that he felt like you can you can be putting all of your uh, time into one thing and, and, or you could just be trying to do a lot of different things and not making any headway. And, um, I totally get what he's talking about here. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely true. We can mess around over here and over here and over here and over here and have all these things going on. But if we're not focused on the one thing that we want to have success in, then, um, and in his case, he's talking about sync licensing then we are maybe just messing around and we're not going to concentrate and get the results we want from uh, one of these one of these things. Yeah. Now, to some extent, I totally um, agree with this. I, I, I agree that you have to really be focused on uh, what you think the main thing for you is going to be. And if you're not, you can easily get sidetracked and never get anything done. And I think this has been something that's plagued me through my life, in the, in not necessarily now, but back in the day, probably you too, where you were just trying this, you're trying that, you're playing gigs, you're doing this and that kind <clears> of thing. <throat> I think the problem with this for 
our listeners and, and anybody who is trying to figure out music income, especially music income that you can live off of, is that um, I think it's, it's imperative that you probably have a lot of things going on as well as the things you concentrate on. So, um, and sync licensing, the problem with sync licensing right off the bat is how long it takes to build it up into something that's actually going to make you a music income that's going to pay your bills. And for someone who's been in it for a couple dozen years or 10 years or whatever, if you focused on it, you have time, you now have a consistent stream of income most likely from it, maybe a very good income stream. Although I will say that for every person that is supposedly, uh, supposedly is not a good idea, but for everyone that says, you know, this is, that has built a sync licensing career, I also find that they are selling something else at the same time they are selling a sync licensing career. Mm -hmm. Even, um, you know, I have, I know someone who really uh, does all her own uh, pushing. She doesn't even use libraries. She goes straight to the music supervisors <clears throat> and yet is pushing $2,000 courses and things like that. And so it makes me really wonder if sync licensing is the top can be at the only income that people have because everybody i talk to uh, john meyer who i just talked to and everybody it's still 60 percent 70 percent of the income and there has to be other things little other little streams coming in um so that's i, I don't know what do you think about that well i i yeah i mean jesse makes some great points i'm, I'm even thinking of when um i think dave crop had mentioned on uh one or two occasions that like his royalty statements like vary quite a bit too so I don't, i'm not sure how much consistency you can depend on with sync licensing royalties right. um even not if to they... mention it's quarterly that means you're right, only getting right. four checks per year who can live on even if they were five thousand dollars every check Let's, and right now, if you and I got a five thousand dollar PRO check, we'd be like, "Whoa, that's awesome!" Sure. Still, that wouldn't pay for your life. You well, know? I couldn't live on twenty thousand dollars a no. year. I mean, um, th there would have to be other things. That I mean, even Jesse himself, it's like you know, he's freely admitted on that video um, that he's focusing on. Uh, I, and I would imagine that Sync My Music or Sync Academy is is a he, is a focus for him at this point yeah. uh, in his life. Um, and, uh, and that's good. You know, that's good. I mean, like I have the Academy, uh, I have uh, multiple income streams and, um, you know, just, there's, there's days where I wake up and I feel like I'm stretching myself too thin. And I, I think that Jesse makes a good point in the sense that like, you know, there's, if there's one thing that's working, then you should focus on it. And if you, if you're spreading yourself out, um, into all of these different areas, then you're not going to be able to, um, you know, do particularly well in, in any one thing. And there's some truth yeah. to that. Yeah, I think, absolutely. I think that there's some where there's like a bit of where there's a discussion to be had is like, is at what point in your, in your trajectory, like, where are you in your, in your career, I guess, or in your, like, um, in your journey. And I kind of think that what we talk about often, like, is like, uh, you know, where, like, uh, we're kind of use like, uh, trying to figure out a reference point for, like, people starting out their journey. Like, we talk about this a lot. Like, you know, if you're just getting into this game, if you're just starting to produce, uh, you know, good music and you're trying to figure out, like, okay, where do I put it? Where do I throw it out there? Um, I think both of our philosophy is sort of like, let's just throw it everywhere and anywhere that you can um, to start with, right? And so that might be that might mean like you're kind of spreading yourself out into a lot of different potential avenues, um, just to see what works. But like I think that once you have some some momentum in any particular area, whether it be sync licensing, uh, stock music licensing, uh, you know you're doing uh, whether it be uh, you know you're doing custom production work, or whatever. Um, I think it's important to see what's working for you, and then to, and to kind of like continue down that path and like and and take it as far as you can. Um, so for me, that meant that has translated to like working with Artlist, for example, like, you know, that uh, first application to those few s stock libraries has, has now evolved into me doing like custom production work for, for Artlist originals. And that's something mm -hmm. that, um, that's like a paycheck that I can depend on. So I'm focusing in on that because it's, it's money that I know I can make, 
Um, and it's it's work that I know that's going to keep coming for you know for hopefully for a long time. Um, for me to to like divide that precious time into like you know at this point into like writing all of these albums for different sync libraries potentially is not a good idea for me right now because it's yeah. like I might be spreading myself out too thin by doing that. Do you know what I mean? Yes, but you have probably two to three main concentrations and yeah. and then and but you do all the other things a little as well and so yes i agree i just think for most of us the sync and, and we'll get off sync licensing after this but i i just feel like sync licensing is something we are all trying to start at it's almost like one of our other little things that we hope surely becomes another thing. You probably hope your Spotify stuff becomes more. Depending on who you are, you'll have different things of these that you hope becomes the main thing. Mm -hmm. But And for me, I hope sync licensing becomes the main thing. I, I don't see that ever happening completely. Although, un unless I'm like retired and I don't need as much income to, to pay the bills. Like it, there's no way. I, I, I can't imagine how it would pay all the bills right now or, or even 80% of them. Um, for years to come. And so while I think sync licensing is an important thing that you should be doing, and all of you who are listening to this channel, if you are any kind of producer or artist, sync licensing is a great possible um, way for you to make some money as well. Mm -hmm. It might better be one of your smaller things as you get started. You should focus on it. You should put great focus on it. But um, for me, I, I can't put I, I'm just not able, even though in my mind, I probably put 80% focus on it or 75% focus on it. I still have too many other things I have to actually put my time into. And I think maybe that's the difference that I'm talking about here is what, how much of your focus are you putting on it versus how much of your time are you putting on it? And maybe that's what Jesse was talking about too. Um, he did yeah. mention uh, stock music licensing, and I know this is not his wheelhouse and not something that he uh personally thinks uh is is as is as successful and he he's probably right depending on we both know and you are one of people who do very well in stock or have done very well in stock and but if even you would say it's a very specific type of stock music it's not just anything you write you throw up there like me you have a very specific method for your stock music licensing and it's probably if you if you count art list in this it's probably your main focus would you say well i mean no let's 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 not say focus but where you put your time no i would still say that the, the time wise and focus wise the production music the academy, academy is my as my absolute number one uh okay. thing at this point um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's like number two. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I definitely put a lot of effort into, uh, writing music for, for Artlist. It takes up a lot of my time and my, and my focus as well, like the projects that I'm doing with them. So for sure, it's like my time feels even pretty evenly split between that and the Academy these days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and for me, stock has taken, uh, even going back to the beginning of last year where I said, you know, I'm only seeing this be a tiny percentage. I'm going to spend less time on stock this year. And I did. And I did get a lot more into sync last year and got a lot more albums out and got more uh, relationships happening and stuff like that happening. Plus, I started another big um, career for me, which is, and we both can pretty much say this, 50% probably of our time and income is spent teaching uh, or educating, you could say. Um, the academy is maybe not a traditional school, but it's certainly an educational uh, push, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, for sure. And community. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, creating educational content is is essentially the same as teaching. You're just it just involves you know filming and editing and all that kind yeah. of stuff. But um, yeah, you know, like rewind the clock, like a year ago, I was teaching uh, like 10, 10 to you know fifteen students as well at one point uh, with guitar, um, and that's something that, again, you know, coming back to the time issue, it's like it's something I just didn't have time for in the end. And you really have to keep asking yourself. <clears throat> that multiple times throughout your life it's like like what what do you want to focus on what's bringing you results what are you most passionate about and then you know make decisions based on that because like go I, I started to resent having to go teach you know and that's not a good place to be so if, uh, if you feel like that then then you kind of have to like 
ask yourself, like, is this something I should be doing, you know? Yeah, and I, I just realized, at, um, and, and so I think it's fair to say that music teaching for us has become um, music teaching of some kind. Before I did this job, I, I taught privately like you, you did, mm -hmm. and that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I think, I mean, I don't, I like teaching privately on my channel, but yeah, I'm not sure I wanted to teach uh, privately to kids. And yeah, that's like that. that's what I'm. That's exactly what I'm saying. Is like I love teaching. I just didn't want to teach guitar lessons in the way that I was doing previously. It just makes much yeah. more sense for me to to be doing it in the in the setting of like an academy online and being able to interface with people like that. Absolutely amazing and honorable to teach kids and, uh, and people totally. of any age. Nothing against and, kids. <laughs> yeah. No. And and every, every kid needs a a good somebody speaking music into their life for, for sure. sure yeah for sure I but um for me music teaching just is something since i i finished a master's a few years ago that the whole point um at least i told my wife was that hey i could add uh, income music income by teaching and so i have um i did want to go back to stock for just a second because i mm -hmm. i I did make the point that some people like yourself, Lester, and other people that we know are making some pretty considerable, amazing income with stock music and with content ID with back end of stock music. And but there are also a lot of us just like with sync that are feel like we might be spinning our wheels as we make music to put up and it gets one download, it gets two downloads because on motion array, you can see how many downloads it gets. So you make five bucks on Pond 5 and you get a dollar or something out of that and people are wondering if it is worth their time um, for long or short game they're just really wondering is this something they should do and then other people are saying hey if you enjoy it go do it and and do it for fun use it like I do as a, a place for all my non-exclusive stuff whether it does well on stock or not it's there maybe at Easter or Christmas or whenever, like you had a Halloween song that did really well, maybe the, a, a, a particular song um, will do very well. And I've had that happen with a Halloween type of song too. Halloween music, folks, holiday music is the, is the key, I think. Yeah. But anyway, um, you know, so I think people are on our Discord right now, there is some, some real serious discussion about people wanting to give up on stock music just because what they were promised by gurus who talked about stock music, including us, um, or not promised necessarily, but what they saw happening is not happening for them. It's not translating to their music. It's not translating to their careers. And so people who thought, and at one point we both thought this before things have changed, but you could just do this. And that would just be enough to, I mean, the way it was going at the time, it seemed like it was just going up. And then, you know, we hit the year of 2022 and then 20 now this year has been a very, very slow start in yeah. stock. So. Yeah. Well, I, I went, I always went, feel like I went into stock licensing, stock music licensing, um, knowing like with, with like the expectation that this wasn't going to be something that was going to, is going to provide me like a full time, uh, income. Right. You know, I just, I think just thinking back to the the videos of, you know, thinking back to watching Daniel Carzales' videos and mm -hmm. seeing how volatile it was for him. Um, I think I kind of understood, you know, going into it that it was going to be a wild ride and uh, there was probably going to be some months that were great and others that were, that weren't so great. And um, that's been the case, man. So I wouldn't to really me, recommend anybody like, you know, throw their all, all their eggs in the stock music basket for sure. I mean, you really got to be pushing yourself to, to go find opportunities for yourself, like at all times, you know, these the things are not dependable. The beautiful thing about either licensing, stock or sync, is you might find uses for songs that you have sitting around not doing anything that you've recorded through the years. I, I approached both of these with songs I had already had recorded for many, many years and some that I had written a long time ago and just re did new things. But stock music especially was a back of that dump truck up and just dump that stuff in. And for the first year, especially on Motion Array, it was like a gold mine of, of monthly income now it wasn't thousands of dollars but it was hundreds every month and i thought mm -hmm. wow this is not bad and even last year i averaged i even though i only averaged about 250 a month i really didn't put any time into it i just really only threw in there anything that i just created for the heck of it or i just created that didn't fit sync or i just created for some other use and i just threw it in there i did it without a care really 
Um, for whatever reason, um, it just didn't work out to, to make a lot for me. But I, I, I'm still, I mean, it's not like I'm going to go, I am taking all my music down and I'm not going to let them have it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why not? Who knows mm -hmm. when a song could take off on Content ID and make you, you know, a hundred bucks or something like that. And it's just sitting there. Why not? But yeah, yeah. so stock music <clears throat> can be that thing. I think, again, the same as sync. Stock might be kind of something that both of these passive incomes might be something that you don't use as your main income um, yet, at least. Maybe you can get to a place where you're creating for Artlist Originals and you really love doing that and, and you can make, you can count on some some income. And that's Supplemental income, you know, that's what it's all about. I mean, yeah. I think there's so many people listening and uh, th that I have like, a, a, you know, they're happy with their career, oh, yeah. you know, they're not ready to like leave their, their job. Um, and <laughs> just like dive into the deep end of and their of, benefits uh, and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Exactly. They've got it. They love it. Exactly. And all of both of these things are perfect things to do when yeah, you have another 100%. job and you just do it and enjoy what you're doing and, and see what happens. And if not a lot happens, it doesn't really mean anything other than it's just a hard for people to find exactly the song they want. Um, and yours may or may not be found just by whatever search happens, you know, and so the next thing I want to talk about, which we've talked about music teaching, which I think is, is a quick, not a quick, but a, a certainly a way to get an income that is substantial, that pays bills. I think another thing that I always feel, and this is probably the next thing I'm going to move into on my channel as far as an ebook and teaching and talking about is my life as a music producer and how that was literally a six-figure income for me for for decades basically uh, not not every year but some years was way over six figures some years was close to it and uh, you you for all of you who think you can make great music for television if you can make great music for television and for film and you can make great music that gets accepted onto some of these higher um, uh, these places that curate carefully like motion array or artlist you have the skills then to produce for other people and there is a lot of music, a lot of people uh, come through our school and their whole goal is to produce music for artists and things like that. And yeah. it, it may seem like that that <clears throat> is something that is kind of passe now, but it's not. And there are artists out there needing people to make them beats and to record them and to, uh, to market them even, uh, all these kind of things. So I think music production is one of those things that uh, we we tend to not talk about as much as the licensing passive income things because music producing is not very passive. You have to be active. You have to be out there finding clients and you can find them online. But music producing doesn't just mean producing people in the studio. It could mean producing people across the world and around the world. Yeah, I mean, my days of, of recording bands and, and like producing artists and are like are, are long uh, behind me. Um, for now. I don't I don't have much experience in it uh, anyway to speak of to be honest uh, but and I, I don't think... mean just taking them into the studio and producing I mean creating tracks for them and mixing it yourself which is stuff that you could do all day long and and music producing for clients as well as artists yeah that's what I yeah that's my kind of uh, specialty I guess is just producing original music for a very specific use case and you know for for me i have some experience doing it like film scoring and um working with uh, some ad agencies and, and such but uh i think man like you know i i know i know some friends who have done really well with um as being producers writing music for for artists working with artists primarily as well um and who've built up beautiful studios just on that uh, income alone i'm starting to see an audience of possible production clients in in composers people who are really good composers but they're not good producers yet they don't have the sounds they don't have uh the ear for producing or mixing or mastering or any of that kind of stuff i think there is a lot of room out there if you are a person who can make great mixes and produce and mix well for you to find this new breed of composer who is looking to create at home and composing things, but they can't necessarily get the mixes they want or the mastering they want. And I think there's a wide open world. And if you just go to someplace like soundbetter.com, there is a great way to market yourself there yeah. from any place you are in the <clears throat> world to make money. And uh, we also know about Upwork and Fiverr and things like that. So I think Again, you have to find what is going to be your thing. For me, music production is still part of what I do, if not 
artist uh, development type of type of jobs, but they kind of work hand in hand. Uh, you're producing something for the for an artist or a client, and this is still this plus teaching are my main two incomes still. Um, if I had to like just stack up the first the two that make me probably eighty or ninety percent of my income, it's these two. Yeah, and uh, and music same. teaching includes this YouTube channel and podcast. You know? Yeah, same. This is exact same for me for sure. All right, um, a few things that uh, Jesse mentioned and didn't mention that I want to talk <clears> about <throat> here. Um, selling beats is something that uh, I know a lot of people look at. I think this is more done in maybe the hip hop genre than any place else, or the rap world, or things like that, where you have people selling tracks as to be used as beats with someone putting a top line or something over. Um, I think this and the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is gaming music, are both very uh, tight uh, genres, tight uh, little worlds that, because if you sell beats, you likely can't pitch those anywhere else and, and almost do much else with them. I know Clint talks about taking some of his non-exclusive things and selling them on uh, stock and also selling the beats in a beat store. I guess you could do that, uh, but you really can't do that with gaming music, that you make music for gaming because you've got to be careful putting that kind of stuff in non-exclusive libraries and or content ID because <clears throat> then there's all sorts of content ID problems that can happen for, for gamers and stuff. I think both are a very specific hustle, you know, I, and I don't have any experience in either of them really. Uh, but I, I have had several Academy members ask me to, to look into selling beats. Um, and you know, from what, from what I've gathered, just listening to people talk about it on YouTube, it's, um, it's a hustle in the sense of, you know, you're reaching out to people, you're trying to build personal relationships. Yeah, and I think gaming music, we, we both know our friend Stephen um, Malin, Malin, who yeah. uh, really runs a great channel about this. He is all in on this and he is focused on it and his students who run, or in his academy or whatever he calls it, are also very, very focused on making music for games. And I think it's a, it's a specialty. And uh, maybe, maybe also and, something that requires personal connections, kind of like networking, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, uh, which yeah. I think is, you know, that's fine if you're if you're into that and if you want to if you want to hustle on that end. I think that that's that that's kind of the appeal of sync licensing and stock music licensing is it doesn't require um, having to to hustle for like personal relationships to, to some no, extent. Sync does, I think it does. But like, you know, you could you could like submit a track to motion ray and make you know money potentially without ever having yep. to really do a lot of like you know building personal relationships that, that that's what i mean on a very yeah. basic level but yeah. it, it's not the same with the game music and selling beats to from what yeah. i understand i think is i don't know if that's fair to say well i think there's very similar because you can upload them anonymously and never talk to anybody up to the gaming Oh, music like game platforms. dev market and stuff? Yes, that kind of stuff is what I'm talking about sure, here. Yeah. Not, not providing games. I think gaming, uh, providing music to like EA Sports video games probably falls more in the sync world than it does in the gaming music world. It seems like they're talking more about uh, computer games, games for phones and things like that. And, right. um, and, and those are, the way they're talking about making income there is working for a game that, you know, like we would be approached to write a score or create a song for a certain kind of thing. Um, they are being approached to write music for a certain video game. That can happen, and that's more of a one-off type of gaming music income where you're hired for a specific game. Yeah, But yeah. a lot on those channels, they're talking about putting stuff up at Game Dev Market and all the other places um, and where you put it up there and people just find it and download it and... You right, but is, that, is, that, that, is that like what Steve Malin is sort of trying to push? Is like, is it getting on both. game dev market? He's doing both. Yeah, because I, I would imagine that he probably makes more of more income being like a like doing you know projects for specific uh, probably developers. He, he lays all that out just like you and I do. He'll go through his end of year stuff and and how much he made by putting it on the game development markets, which is a lot, and then how much hmm. he did for private projects where he was just at, uh, you know contracted to do a certain game. So uh, both cool. of those are a thing. And again, if that's your thing, if gaming music is your thing and games and you just love creating music for games or you love making beats for rappers and for hip hop type uses, those might be the places that you concentrate more than stock music 
or more than sync or more than any of the other things. Right. Um, another thing that Steve talked about, and I'm not going to spend <clears> much time <throat> on this because I don't, uh, or I should say that uh, Jesse talked about, is NFTs, I think, again, a very focused type of thing. Um, and to me, a, a bit of a flash in the pan type of thing, although, you know, who knows? Um, we all thought PayPal was going to be a flash in the pan too, and it, it's one of the main banks in the world. But uh, NFTs are something that where you can sell um, uh, license, basically, how would you define it? Like licenses for a song that you, only you own or something like that, and uh, images and songs and different things that uh, are you'd own the digital rights to. Yeah, you could basically like own the digital rights to it, um, but it, it's not necessarily like it doesn't have to be like an object. It could be something uh, a little bit more like it could be like Jack Dorsey's first tweet. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Something <laughs> a little bit more. Um, Again, probably a specialty market, a specialty type of thing that you're going to do and probably more on the artist side of anything, I would say. I, I think it's one of those things where where you've seen uh, several cases of, of uh, artists with big followings selling NFTs. And, th and that's just it is I think that like, you know, the people who have had some success with it have had a large audience to sell it to. So it's kind yeah. of like a, like a novelty item. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, going along this same kind of specialty road, I think is something you brought up earlier, which is Atmos and spatial audio mixing. Um, <clears throat> Atmos isn't the only one. I just listened to a great podcast the other day talking about um, another kind of spatial audio by, I can't remember it right now. But anyway, these kind of mixing uh, in what we call, at the school, we have an, an Atmos studio now, and it cool. is... Uh, it's 7.1.4 is what they call it, where you have seven, you have uh, three speakers in the front, uh, left, right, and middle. Mm -hmm. You have two speakers kind of behind you on the, in the on the sides, and two speakers in the back, and a and a subwoofer. Right. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven point one, which is the subwoofer, and then there are four other speakers that are a square around your around your head as the engineer sitting back behind the board. So wow. and there is software to move stuff around that is that is rotating around the room and moving stuff. And so you get all this kind of movement. And we've been actually uh, mixing some of my older stuff in uh, Atmos there. And um, now here's Pretty the cool. problem. It's very cool and it sounds lovely. I mean, it's like candy for your ears. Speaking of of Easter eggs, it is it is <laughs> literally Cadbury eggs for your ears, and it sounds <laughs> makes it's some things sound really good. Now some things, like rock and roll, it's hard to spread that out. It loses its cohesion eventually when you spread it out too much. But a lot of stuff that's like Earth, Wind, and Fire, man, it's like magic with all the horns and everything going on. It's just beautiful. But um, the problem I see with Atmos and what makes it a little bit of a specialty thing is it's just not widely widely adopted. There's that's what not I, many that's what places to wondering. listen. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like how many people are consuming audio this way. I mean, I suppose as time goes on, maybe more and more. But uh... one of my co-teachers who is basically teaching that class right now, he went to Best Buy, just Best Buy, you know, just and and trying to see what kind of products that he could buy for a home like you were talking about to have it at home yeah and the first answer the easy answer is apple's earbuds their pro earbuds or whatever and their new headphones they they you can hear although i'm not sure how you hear surround sound in headphones that doesn't make much sense to me if, i mean it's a surrounding your ears i guess but it simulates atmos okay but if we're talking about spatial audio that you're in the room listen to a spatial audio thing which is very cool if you ever are but how many people are, you know? And even at Best Buy, the best thing they're selling is, you know, like a sound bar with a yeah, couple yeah. of speakers that you can detach and a, 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 a subwoofer or two. He saw one that had two subwoofers, uh -huh. which is way more than subwoofers that you need, I would think. But again, wh who is going to have this in their home uh, consistently or be going to places that <clears throat> that have this and hear it? Is, I guess theoretically, you could put it in a car. But, um, you know, it's a good question, man. I mean, it's like as, as we, you know, as the as TVs have gotten so cheap, um, you know, and it's and and so many people, including myself, you know, watch 
uh, sit down, watch TV at the end of the day and, and okay. consume this. So, I mean, it's like it only if 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 we all start adopting um, if it becomes, you know, affordable and, and easy to set up like a surround sound system. And that's the majority of how that's the, uh, how people are consuming music and, and sound when they watch TV. Then you it only goes it only you know, it, it would only make sense that the sync music libraries will start asking music producers to to produce music with in you know um, mixed for surround sound I, I i guess right i fought my wife every uh, every week on why i have all these speakers set up everywhere you know we had a front and we had a left and right and we had a left and right in the back and we had a subwoofer and she was always mad because there were wires going everywhere and there were speakers everywhere. And why did this speaker have to be right in this one spot and all this kind of stuff? And I think most people, I'm not talking about musicians or musicians' wives who are also musically, you know, lo love that kind of thing. I just don't think there's enough people who care enough to have all those things. Now, all this being said, there are... Every song in, it's a little like CDs, remaking everybody's old albums in CD format and selling it. L labels are going crazy, remixing everything in Atmos right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a big job for a lot of engineers in Los Angeles and other places and people who are specialists in mixing in Atmos and other spatial audio type of formats. And so this is something that you could, you could make your main thing. Maybe you are an engineer and you love the idea of this and let me tell you it sounds beautiful and so I would love I love listening to it and just sit in that room and listen to great Atmos mixes and so there is work out there for it and if you can find it might be relationship based but if you can find that work this could be a thing for you as an engineer for sure mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious to try these headphones that simulate it yeah, Apple's newest so headphones, they, they simulate it, and they're, they're over-the-ear headphones. They also, but their pro earbuds supposedly also simulate it, so you can look at those. Yeah, I bought my wife um, those Apple Air, uh, AirPods, mm -hmm. and uh, the noise cancellation technology they use is crazy, man. Is it the one with the rubber tips on them? <clears throat> I think so, yeah. It's like the, the, the best model you can get. They it's should like... be the ones that do it, so get hers. Go to... Uh, go to um, on Spotify, they have uh, Adobe Atmos uh, playlists. Okay, I'm going to check that and out. And try it out. I'll mm -hmm. check it out today. And everybody should try it out because it is a little bit life-changing when you hear stuff mixed that way. It just uh, it just sounds amazing. All right, so that is something you could be make your main thing. Gigs is something you can do, and probably many of you do. And this is a long-time income for people. Um, not for me. Uh, it was back in the day, and I just don't have that much time to do it now. It's a little like golfing. You know, you have to be prepared for four hours away, you know. And uh, But uh, you still do this as, as a income. But it's it's probably a want to rather than a have to and just a fun thing that you do. Yeah, it is now. It is now. I mean, I think I, I kind of burnt myself out <clears throat> on it um, at one point, and I went too hard um, on it, and, and I kind of like – felt I felt like it was sort of taking away from the experience and and the fun uh, and the joy of it at one point in my life. And I think, you know, since COVID, it rightfully took just like a, like a nice backseat to everything for a while. And um, um, and I, I had an opportunity to, fo to focus on other things in life. And that's felt really good to do that because I've sort of been able to reassess some of the the poor decisions I was making during the time that I was gigging a lot, um, specifically re relating to just like taking care of my my health, my physical and mental health. Um, so that being said, like you know, fast forward to now, it's it's something that I kind of want to get back into um, with a fresh uh, mindset. And like I think it's it really is more than more than anything, it's just about the joy of of music and and um, getting out. And, and feeling alive, man, you know, it's uh, not not a big money maker maker for me um, at all. But uh, it really is a magical experience that uh, is like really, you know, it reinvigorates me uh, every time I get up on stage. It's a little bit scary and it's good to get scared once in a while. And uh, it, it kind of like makes it makes sense to do it for me. But um, maybe as time goes on, it'll be something that I do more often and I, I get more comfortable with. But I think I kind of had like a negative relationship with it 
uh, at one point in my life. And so it's been good to sort of like reassess all of that. It's a tough thing to keep going. It's tough, um, man. It's really it, tough. It's, but we both know people who have made this their main thing for years and years. And you, uh, sometimes they burn out on it. I know people who don't. I know people who want to be on the road. They yeah, just, no, they I don't s- same. I have a couple of friends that are just road warriors. Like yeah. they're, they're, they're constantly touring. I couldn't do it myself. Uh, so some of the members in the academy, too, actually, are full-time gigging mm-hmm. musicians as well. And, and so it can be a, a main thing, and then stock and sync and these other things are just like part-time little little things that they do for fun. Sure. And I think that's where we're going with all of this stuff. And merch is something you can get into. And, um, you know, I think once you're an artist who's also gigging, Spotify sales, they, they call it the long tail, basically, which means the more you gig and tell people where to go to get your stuff, the more people that kind of follow that and become your followers and and like you. And so this is something that I think, again, we treat Spotify sometimes like this passive income that is, hey, if we put it up there, it should sell just like stock music or whatever. And we think, oh, why aren't people finding it? Well, they don't know how to find it, just like they don't know how to find your gig unless you market that you're going to be at a place or you're at a place that just instantly brings people. And sometimes you can get in a Spotify playlist, but I do know people and we both know people and um, Dan Barracudas or somebody like this and uh, the guys that really push um, themselves on Spotify like Tom Dupree the third and like Andrew Southworth these are guys who focus on Spotify being an income now they've spent a lot to to develop that but we could all say the same about I could tell you the same amount I've spent on sync so far I'm way more in the red with sync than I am in the black where I've created stuff through the years with partners and we've paid to have songs made and they're in sync libraries now, but at what cost and will we ever be, uh, you know, paid back for all those costs. So I think people could say that about Spotify too. And those guys now are both have healthy followers, followings there. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. and I think this is a worthy thing to focus on too. This is the new music business. This is how people find you and listen to your music. They're, it's bigger than radio. It's bigger than anything else. It, there's, it, there is no physical product anymore. It's this. So this is certainly something that you could focus on as much as you want, really. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to build the Spotify following and make that a legit thing. And it's just, again, it's so difficult to, um, you know, to assess the, the time that you have in a day to, to, to focus on things and... Um, Unfortunately for me, like Spotify, as much as I'd love to really, really tackle it hard, it's got to take a little bit of a backseat to yeah. um, to the production work and the academy. Uh, those are the most important things in my life right now and um, don't have all the time in the world to get into uh, uh, into the weeds with Spotify. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, it kind of grows on its own. We'll see. But, but we've literally met people on this show that make their living and um, that pay their rent with Spotify income. So it can happen. And uh, same with session work. I see this is something that Jesse had on his list as well is that, you know, I know people in Nashville that they're 100% or 90% of their income is from session work. And they would be lost in Los Angeles or or, uh, in Nashville without session work to do this full time. And I know a lot of singers and players who use sound better in those kind of places. And they that's a significant, if not the biggest income that they have is the session work that they do. Yeah. So again, mm-hmm. you're seeing a pattern here. Any of these things that you choose to be your your main thing can be the main thing. In Jesse's world, that is sync. In uh, a singer in Nashville's uh, world, that might be session work. Uh, in Dan Barracuda's world, that might be Spotify. Um, there are people who even can make income with social media. I don't see how you do it. Um, I mean, I don't count YouTube as social media. I count YouTube as more of a broadcast type of teaching platform or something. I don't, or, or entertainment. Social media, I think, is a much more difficult place to make any income from. What do you think? Well, I, th- I, th- I think YouTube is social media. I, I just, uh, I think maybe you're referring to just like specifically Instagram or like uh, uh, yeah. TikTok or something like that. I yeah, mean, if you have Facebook. big followings, um, on those platforms, then, uh, you know, you can make money as an affiliate marketer, um, uh, as an influencer or whatever. Um, 
I think it's pretty hard. But like Jesse said in his video, I mean, you know, building up social media following is like, oh, that's full time. Um, yeah. That's a full time effort, man. It's not it's no easy task to do that. And um, yeah, like we've been saying this whole podcast, if you want to focus your energy on something like that completely and fully, then then go for it. But uh, um, yeah, it probably takes up, you know, it probably take quite a following to start making a full time living as a as a social media influencer, I imagine. Yeah, but those people probably want to do that. They're probably not. Uh, we know people who are making music on there and they only focus on TikTok videos and they really aren't worried about. Uh, they do also work about worry about Spotify, because from what I understand, that kind of feeds. They both feed each other. A little right. Bit, yeah, but. right. And then something I might be getting into soon, Steve, now that I've done this remix, uh, remix competitions. I didn't even know this was a thing, but this is another thing that Jesse talked about. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, these are these are things that you can put your music into. But the main point of this, folks, and to kind of wrap this up, is that you've got to make the main thing, whatever your main thing is, the main thing. So in some ways, in, in many ways, uh, I agree with what Jesse said in his video that, you know, in, in his world, that's sync licensing. And in the world of the students he's trying to teach and reach out to, and the majority of the people who are watching his channel are people who want sync licensing to be the main thing, then he's right. You can't dabble in 40 things and and never put the main time of that you have and the main focus into one thing. You have to you have to choose the thing. And both Steve and I have chose two things or three things that we put the majority of our time into, even though we we have other interests. We'd love for Spotify to do stuff. We'd love for session work and we'll do gigs and we're interested in Atmos and you know, uh, all these other kinds of things, stock and sync and, and different things, this podcast, our YouTube channels, you know, we, we, you have to stack those up and put these things and figure out where you're going to put your Easter eggs and your Cadbury eggs, where are you going to put them? Where are you going to put each of the things that you love to do? Which, if I can leave you with nothing else from this podcast, and that is thinking about the thing that you, or the things maybe the top two things that you're going to put most of your time into. That really freed me up a bit this year. When I decided at the beginning of the year, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put everything in the back seat except the things that make me 80% or 90% of my income. Right. And that helped my brain a little just to relax and focus on the things that were going to really bring in the income and do well at those things. And then the other, and then I have sync licensing, which is, is is on its way you know um so and to me that is a a, a focus for me it's just not my time folk I, I i put you could call it my number one hobby hoping it becomes a a, a you know a, a an income stream a larger income stream, and, an as, income stream. and as it be potentially becomes a larger income stream then you can reassess the amount of time that you're putting into totally. this um down the road I mean, these yep. things are always fluid right yep. i think that if at the end of the day like this the, the message here is like, for me is, is like, um, at one point you're going to be, uh, or at multiple points, you're going to be faced with having to make a decision about what are the, what are the main things or thing it could be, you know, one, two, maybe even three things, um, that are, are worth your time to pursue. But I think also in order to find out what that main thing is, you kind of have to throw out a lot of ideas and you have to throw your music into a lot of different places and you got to be experimental um, and maybe spread yourself out uh, initially but eventually you're going to have to make a decision about what's what's making sense for you yep yep well folks i hope this has helped and um again sometimes we have to just go through these things to talk about what's happening right now because like steve said everything is fluid uh stock can seem like the greatest idea in the world sometimes it seems like the dumbest idea in the world uh, same with sync, same with music producing, same with teaching, all these things, every one of these things we talked about can be the right thing for you or the wrong thing for you. And, and you just have to make those decisions. And if you're looking for a little clarity, try to figure out what the things you want to do the most and, and what can bring you the most income now. We talk about this a lot. We just did a podcast a few episodes back about how do we get income now while we're waiting for all these little things. And we talk about that a little bit. So I hope this has helped. And so. that's about all I have, Steve. Anything yeah, else? same here. Good chat. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching and listening, and we will talk to you guys next week. Have a great week. Yeah, see you guys. Bye.